Welcome to the New School of Marketing podcast, the place for smart, simple strategies that will amplify your business results. Sharing practical tips, insider knowledge and actionable advice because marketing is something that every business owner can do. Now, let's get started. Introducing your host, Bianca McKenzie, mum, lover of snow sports, camping, horse riding and in-demand launch strategist and Facebook advertising knowledge bank. Welcome to the New School of Marketing podcast. I'm Bianca McKenzie, and today I'm talking about turning your content into courses with Sam Winch. Sam Winch helps busy entrepreneurs turn their content into courses. With over 10 years' experience building courses, she knows how to make the process as painless as possible. Building courses and content to suit diverse environments and audiences is the jam in her sandwich. When she's not busy creating courses or making terrible sandwich puns about her name, she's got a handful or her hands full wrangling four kids. And a little interesting fact about Sam is that she plays more Minecraft than her kids do. Wow, with four kids, that um, that's pretty epic, actually, Sam. <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. Oh, four kids, hey, wrangling. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I do it sometimes. I just stop counting. You just, you just yell at one of them and they all come running and it's good. Like, <laughs> after a while, it doesn't matter. <laughs> love it, love it. Well, um, apart from, yeah, the, the, the sandwich puns, I, I seriously love that. It's like the best intro <laughs> that you can have. Sandwich. <laughs> um, but yeah, your jam is, I guess, yeah, courses. So let's dive right in and focus on the subject of this podcast, which is totally your zone of genius, and that is turning content into courses. Can you tell us a little bit more about the difference between content and course? Because I know that people will be sitting there going, hang on, what? I can use my content? How does that work? Yeah, so um, content is part of a course, but isn't necessarily a course by itself. And sometimes that's a bit hard to wrap your head around. Um, As a general rule, content stands alone. So you could go to someone's website and read one blog post or watch one video, and that's fine, right? It, It serves its purpose. A course is more of a linear journey from A to B or A to Z, I guess, depending on the size of your course. So it has a specific start point and a specific end point, and it takes them on a journey to deliver them an outcome at the end. Now, some good pieces of content kind of do that, but with a course, we're being really strategic about making sure that our intention is to help them get to point B, because otherwise there is no point of them taking the course. It's all about the outcome and it's all about giving them what they came for. It's not just about teaching. It's not just about giving them information, but it's about making sure that they can do it by the end. And often that means helping them to implement and giving them action steps and all those sorts of bits. But I think the simplest way to think of it is course, a content is normally a single piece that stand alone. And a course is a, a linear progression from A to B. It, it takes them on a journey to a specific end point. That sounds good. Thank you. That makes sense. So I guess in a way, a course is like a string of <laughs> content, but yeah, well thought yeah. content. Yeah, that's really it. It's just, it's content with a plan, really. It's <laughs> rather than just, and this is sometimes where I find um, when I work with clients, often they've got lots of content and what they're stuck at is the putting it together because they kind of try and just shove it all in together right we get this um course platform and we upload all our videos and we're like done and then it it doesn't feel right and Mm -hmm. when they come to me it doesn't feel right because they're missing those extra bits they're missing the logical progression and the order so they kind of just shove things in but it's not quite in the right order or they're missing the extra bits that go with making it a course the all right what does the student do now or where do they go for support or how do they do this bit and it's, it's really those extra bits that make a course a course. You can have great content and it's still not quite a course if you haven't got those extra bits. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. So if someone wanted to, you know, create their own course and have the, the logical sort of steps in there, um, what would be a good place to start? Like, of course, apart from going to um, your website and, and all of your resources, because I know you share very generously, but yeah, what, where would someone start if they wanted to create a course? 
So the best thing to do is start with the end in mind. Um, and a lot of people I work with are trying to do too many ends. Um, you imagine if you pulled up Google Maps and you told it you wanted to go to three different places at the same time and it would just like get confused and spit an error back at you. Um, in fact, it doesn't even let you do it. So it lets you put in one end address and that's where you're going to go. You can't yeah. put in three at the same time. Um, so it's the same with courses, right? You need, to t- you need to know where you're going to go. And to do that, you need to create a really clear, specific outcome. And you can, you can just say, by the end of this course, they will know how to do this or know how to do that or understand this or understand that. But what, by the end of the program, what will they be able to do or what will they know? And once you've got that clear destination, you can create your map. You can go, okay, well, to get them there, what do I need to teach them? To get them there, what videos do I need to make? To get them there, what PDFs do I need to create? But so many people jump straight into creating the videos and creating the PDFs without really knowing where they're trying to go. And it's really hard to have a map and to work out, to end up at a specific point if you don't know where that point is. So yeah, best thing to do to start with is to sit down and just write a simple sentence. By the end of this course, they will. And once you've worked that out and you're really clear about what that is, everything from there on in becomes heaps easier to do. Yeah, it it sounds so easy. And I like what what you said earlier on that a lot of people have a number of endpoints in mind. I can just totally I'm just sitting there going, hmm, maybe that's me because, you know, as entrepreneurs, we can do, often we can do like a number of things. I'm like, you know, this and this and this. And it, yeah, no, okay, one endpoint, that makes total sense. And yeah. then I guess it's, yeah, trace backwards. Definitely. And <laughs> Follow you're right, the crumbs. <laughs> we're all so multi-talented that we, we want to give, and we're taught to add value as well, right? We're taught that we have yeah. to give more to add value. And so what we try and do is we try and teach them everything we know. But your head is full of so much gold, Bianca, that it wouldn't fit in a course. There's just, yeah. there's no physical way it will all fit in. Um, and lots of the people I work with are the same. They're trying to teach everything inside their course and it, you just can't. Like it does, yeah. it physically doesn't fit inside the box. So it's, it's really about, yeah, working out that one thing, at least starting with one thing. You know what? You can expand, you can build, you can do a second course, you can do all sorts of other things, but start with one um, rather than trying to fix everything at the same time. Yeah, that makes total sense. And you know what? It gets overwhelming too when you try to teach everything. (laughs) Yeah. Like, yeah, your your students probably wouldn't even really get too much value because it might just be overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming for you and for them. Like it's overwhelming for you to build because there's so much stuff in it. You look at your list and you're like, oh my God, I have to record a hundred videos. Like that's crazy overwhelming. Um, and then at the other end, it's overwhelming for them because they open up your course and they're like, oh my God, I have to watch a hundred videos. <laughs> like I, that's not good for anyone. So yeah, it's, um, it's overwhelming for everyone. And you're right. They don't get value from it if they don't do it. If they, if they log in and they see a hundred videos and they go, oh, this is too scary. And they log out again. Yeah. They haven't got any value because they haven't done anything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that makes total sense. All right. Um, so like uh, we've both been in a you know, course creation world for a little bit, you as, you know, teaching and I have a few courses, but I, you, we hear a lot of people speak about live rounds and running evergreen courses. Can you tell our listeners what the difference is between live rounds and evergreen courses and what, what really is the benefit of each of them? Yeah. So a live round is kind of what it says in the box. It's live. And yep. um, what that means is it has a specific start date and all of your students start together on that one date and they run through the content progressively at the same time. So you might say, right, my course starts on January 1st and module one goes out on January 1st and all of your students start module one on January 1st. Um, Evergreen is different. So an evergreen program means that they can sign up at any point in time and they start day one or module one the day they sign up. So I might join your program on January 1st and start module one, but my friend might join February 1st and she starts module one then. And someone else might buy it December next year and they start module one then. So live round means it has a specific start date and everyone goes through it together. Evergreen simply means they can buy it anytime whenever they're ready. Um, There are definitely pros and cons to both. A live round requires a really good launch. And I mean, you'll know this because this is your zone of expertise is, um, you know, all of the launch strategy that goes behind and the, the Facebook ads and the marketing that goes into that. And it's, it's a big deal, right? It can be yeah. a lot of effort. And yes. <laughs> um, I know I'm preaching to the converted there. Like you'll be telling us just how much effort that is. So um, they do sell better because you've got a specific start date. So the yeah. downside to an evergreen program is because it's always there 
eh, it's always there, right? They're like, oh, I'll sign up to that next week or I'll sign up next time I get paid or I'll sign up next year when things go back to normal, whatever normal is. Um, Lack of urgency. Yeah, definitely that lack of urgency. And I hate to put false scarcity on things, but like with a start date with a live round, it's not a false scarcity. It's like that's the specific start date. That's when we're going. Um, So that's definitely in terms of a benefit of a live round, it does sell better, but the effort that goes into selling it is is huge. Evergreen, the benefit is that for your clients, it's there whenever they need it. And especially if they've got an urgent problem that needs fixing. So this really comes down to the type of course you're running. Let's say that you've um, built a course on web design and on fixing a specific problem in WordPress, right? If they have this, suddenly their websites crash, they've got this specific problem, they go to your website, they find your course, ah, oh, but it doesn't start for another three weeks they're probably not going to buy because they they have a problem that needs solving now. Whereas if it was evergreen, they might be like, oh, okay, this thing's going to teach me how to solve this. I'll grab this now. Yeah. Um, Whereas if you're teaching something that they can wait for and they want to go through with other people, then live suits it. So part of it comes down to one, how do you want to sell and launch your program? And two, what is the content that you're trying to teach? Is it something that people can wait for? Is it an urgent thing they need to buy right now? Like what, what are you teaching? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds totally (laughs) yeah I really understand both sides I've tried both sides as well so oh there's definitely pros and cons on on either side and yes live rounds I I know that they sell better and but they are a lot of work but evergreen it's not like it's less work it's just less work in a concentrated like sort of in that like small amount of time Whereas evergreen, it, it's always work. <laughs> That's a good point, Ashley. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. They think that they'll just build this evergreen thing and put it on their website and it will sell. And you and I both know that that doesn't work either. No. Um, and you still have to actively sell an evergreen course as much as you'd have to actively sell a, a live round. And you're right. It's just the live rounds, all of your effort is condensed into one big overwhelming launch period. Whereas evergreen, your work's just kind of spread out across the entire year, but never goes away. Um, there, yeah. And there yeah. isn't a right or wrong. And I've tried no. both as well. Um, part of me, I didn't like the stress of live launching rounds. So I've taken them away for a little while. I might go back in the future. I might do live rounds again. Um, but for me, it's, it's not a right now. Yeah. And that's a good thing too. Like, you know, there is, there is no right or wrong. There is a, just try what works for you and track your numbers and see what works kind of thing. So, Mm. yeah. Um, so when creating courses, we obviously want to teach our students something. I guess that's, you know, one one of the main things. Um, and that's why setting out clear learning outcomes is important. And you sort of touched on that a little bit already, but there are other benefits to setting clear learning outcomes right that people might not be thinking about and I know like you are like one pot of gold with course knowledge can you talk us a little bit through what other benefits apart from having you know those learning outcomes is what what other benefits are there yes you're right there are lots of different benefits I mean the first one is always that for you, it means it's easier to create, which is awesome mm-hmm. because you're really clear about what you're creating. Um, the second thing is once you're super clear on what you're making, it's easier to sell. Like when you're writing your sales page, you know exactly what you're trying to tell them about. You know exactly what their outcomes are. You know, you can write the features and benefits based on that. Like when it comes to writing sales copy, if you're not really sure what the outcome of your course is, how are you going to write a sales page? Like it's just too hard. Um, And so by having some really clear learning outcomes, it makes it much easier to tell other people why they should take the course. The other side of that is that it makes it much easier for them to realize why they should take the course and why they should buy it. So in terms of improving sales, it works on both sides of you sort of writing your sales process and writing your emails and writing your ads. But on the other side, when they land on your sales page or when they're reading your email funnel, they're like, oh, oh, I see, I'm going to get this out of taking this course. Yeah, I do want that outcome. This is for me. Whereas if they've got this wishy-washy feeling of not really understanding what your course is going to do for them, they're never going to buy either. I think, I know that personally I've seen that, but I think that's the case with lots of people. Like if I'm confused during a sales process, mm-hmm. um, if I'm reading the page and I'm like, mm, yeah, but like what do I really get? Like what, what is this going to do for me? What is the point? Um, I'm never going to buy that product or service. Like yeah. I've 
because I just don't see the the outcome for me. And so, it, and I'm sure that's the same for 99% of audiences. Like if they cannot see what they're going to get out of it, why would they invest in it? And so having those super clear learning outcomes, great for building, but even almost even more important for selling. I don't like to say that because I'm all about the building, but even more important for selling. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally, and, and it goes back to that first sentence that, you know, we started off with, you know, by the end of this course, you will and that's you know that's where you put your learning outcomes and and that goes on the sales page too yeah so it's incredibly important to have those learning outcomes before you build it before you create any of your marketing materials so I love that it all goes back to learning outcomes and so yeah I think learning outcomes are a bit like um headlines sometimes as well like you don't always write the best one first Mm -hmm. I know that often if I'm writing like email um email headlines or blog post headers or whatever, like the first one you write is a bit naff. <laughs> it's not really great. Um, and sometimes it's the same with outcomes. Like just that first thing you write down, that might not be it. Like you might need to come back to that and really think, well, what, no, what are they really getting? Like what is the purpose? Yeah. I was um, talking with a client on course co-working sessions the other week and they've gone, oh, I think my outcome is, okay, so she won't mind me mentioning, I'm sure. She's doing a, a teaching program to help parents raise confident kids. And Mm -hmm. she was like, oh, the outcome is confident kids. I'm like, no, it's not. The outcome is enabling parents to feel confident raising their children, which will Uh result in confident kids. But your course isn't for the kid, it's for the parent. And so it's really about working out, well, hang on, who's taking the course and what are they getting from it? Because that's the outcome. The parents aren't going to take the course because it will give them a confident child because you can't guarantee that and you can't really show how you're going to do that. Yeah, but you can show them how you're going to make them a better parent. Yeah, and that's where the outcome comes down to. So yeah, I'd often say to people, definitely write your outcomes, um, but go back to them. Like, think about them again. They're not set in stone. You can rewrite those things at any time. Um, so go back to them. Like, really dig deep. Is that the right outcome? Is that what they're getting from that? Is that who's benefiting from that? Um, and think about yeah, what are the, what are the words you're using to describe that too? Like, it is a selling point. Is it? clearly describing what they're going to get yeah and um sorry I'm sort of going off track a little bit here but um I know that a lot of us work one-on-one with people before we build a course Mm. so I guess that's another way listen to to those people what did they get from working with you like sometimes we we think that they get x but they actually get y and then when you create a course it's like well you've helped people with this and they're telling you that they're getting this from it yeah. So then that's the outcome. So I just, you know, yeah, sort of just thought about that. Definitely. Yeah. And go digging through um, things like testimonials. Like you'll see when they've said, oh, you know, it was amazing working you, with you because like you'll see what they got from it, how they felt after it, how they, you might have removed their stress or enabled them to feel more confident or all those sorts of things. Yeah. And um, coming from sort of a vocational tertiary education background, we were always taught that those are terrible outcomes. Like you never tell someone they'll feel more confident. We avoid emotions, we avoid feelings because they're not tangible. You can't really assess on them. But when it comes down to building sort of online programs, you know what, they, they are part of the process. I think it's silly to ignore them. Yeah. People do get an emotional outcome from these things. They do feel something, feel more yeah. powerful, feel more confident, feel more clarity. And, uh, you know, I don't think we can just gloss over those. They are an important part of the outcome. And they are an important part of our marketing because people purchase with their emotions. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So tangible outcomes are a good thing, but at the same time, emotional outcomes, are, I, I think equal is, equally is important. So yeah, put that in there as well, I would say. <laughs> yeah. And, and you made a really good point there, which I think is equally as important. So I find that a lot of people go with one, they have a focus on one or the other. So I get, I look over their stuff and they've got really clear tangible outcomes and even on the sales page, they've got tangible takeaways. They're like, you get six videos and three workbooks and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And I'm like, well, that's great. But what am I actually getting? Like, yeah. what is the outcome of watching those six videos? But vice versa, I land on a lot of the sales pages and they're like, you'll feel more confident. And I'm like, well, that's great. But what am I, like, yeah. how, why, think, yeah. what am I, what's in it? What am I actually getting? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, which is they're both equally important and you can't really gloss over one or the other because you're going to end up with like a half-baked sales page and a, and a half-baked course if you don't include both. Yeah. God, there's so much to it, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there really is. <laughs> All right. So like I'm at the other end of the course creation journey. So I help, you know, my clients sell their courses by driving Facebook ads traffic. Um, and build lists and support launches. But 
and how we've touched on it a little bit on sales pages and things, but how can people set up their courses so they virtually sell themselves? And I know it's, you know, it's got to do with who you get through your courses. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, so this is a really hard one for me because coming from sort of an education background, we don't have a big focus in sales. And then I've spent the last sort of seven years now in this entrepreneurial space and there's a huge focus on sales, uh, which is important, right? Your course needs to sell, otherwise you put all this effort in. And I know that there are lots of things that make a course sell well. So good sales copy definitely helps. Having a clear sort of ad, having clear traffic. So with you with Facebook ads, like if there's no traffic going anywhere, if you're not building your list, if you're not supporting your launch, you're not going to sell anything. Like that, that's an yeah. important part as well. But I think that having a course that actually works and having raving fans off the back end of that is vitally important as well because they're your great referral tools. Like if someone's taken your program and gone, oh my God, this thing's amazing. You have to go take this course. Like that, I know that when you look at the stats for things like um, hiring a tradie, like a plumber or an electrician, like something like 90% of people say they um, they trust a referral over looking it up on Google or what used yeah. to be yellow pages or whatever. They would much rather ask a friend, hey, have you had a good electrician and get that referral and use that service than just trust a Google search. Um, and it's very similar in, in terms of content and knowledge. We think we've become a bit skeptical about buying things on the internet. Everyone's mm-hmm. promising this, you know, I've got the key to your success. Just follow my three-step program and you're like, everyone is, is saying that. And yeah. so really what we want to know is we want our friends to say, oh, actually I've done this course and it's really good and you can trust it. And yeah. that is so powerful when it comes to selling a course. If you've got great referral generators off the back, if you've got students who've completed your program and who did well, And this is part of the reason why we have to build good courses, right? Because we want people to learn and get the outcome so they can be our raving fans and pass traffic back. Because if they get an average experience and they're like, the course is kind of okay, we're just not going to get the traffic returning because we're not going to have those big raving fans off the back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, I just thought of another question for you. How do we, because I know there's there's plenty of, you know, courses that I've purchased that are just sitting there collecting dust. It's like, oh, I might get to them one day, but maybe not. How do we really encourage people to actually do the course and complete the course? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's there's actually quite a lot of strategies that you can try. Um, something I'm working harder on at the moment is telling people not to buy it, which sounds really silly. Yeah. Um, but I try and be, I've always had a really upfront approach to sales, which is that I inform them and and hope that they make a wise decision. Um, And so part of that will be as part of your sales process, acknowledging how much is involved in the course. So like, you know, you need an hour a week or it will take you approximately this long or there's this much involved so that people go in with an understanding of, oh, I can't just smash this out in a day or I'm not just going to watch three videos and suddenly magically know how to build my own Facebook ads. Like it's those sorts of things. So part of that is definitely making sure that they're clear on the way in what's required of them. Um, And sometimes it's a case of actually saying, look, if you've already signed up for a hundred other courses, perhaps perhaps you don't need another one right now. Perhaps yeah. you want to go finish what you've got first. Yeah. Um, once they're inside, then there's a couple of things we can do. So um, first of all, having bite-sized pieces of content rather than huge overwhelming blocks of content. Mm-hmm. Part of the problem is they come in and they get halfway through a video and their kids start, you know, I've got so many, yeah, I've got so many yeah. kids. The kids have a fight. Someone's hit someone with a wooden hammer. Someone's, I don't know what's happening, but someone's screaming for some reason. Yeah. And so I leave a video halfway and it's really hard to come back. Yeah. And so having those bite-sized pieces of content means that when I sit down, I can smash through a couple of bits. I feel like I'm getting somewhere. I can come back tomorrow night and smash through a couple of bits as opposed to sitting down and going, oh, I have to find an hour to watch this webinar. Like where am I going to find time for that? Yeah. Um, so bite-sized content, actionable outcomes. So for each piece you give them, giving them a little piece to go away and do rather than saving all of their tasks till the end. So websites are another great example of this. If you took a course on building a website and it was like, I don't know, just hours and hours of video and then you got to the end and then they were like, right, go and build your own website. The task is just so overwhelming that you're not going to do it. Yeah. It just feels too big. You're like, oh, but where do I start? And what if I get it wrong? And oh, there's so many bits. Whereas if you'd watched a little video on registering a domain name and then you went and did a domain name and then you had a little video on hosting and then you went and purchased some hosting and then you had a little video on. So you can see how... Yeah. What we're trying to do is push them along slowly, gently along the way rather yeah. than having to scare them and getting them to come back. So part of that, keeping them on board is 
where you're right. Lots of people have lots of courses tucked away somewhere. And once they've stopped and they've gone and it's tucked away in that folder, it's hard to bring them back. Bar emails saying, please come back. Like there's not a lot we can do once they've disconnected. Yeah. So it's a process of keeping them connected first rather than reactively trying to pull them back in. Yeah. Oh, great. So much gold there. Thank you. I'm glad I asked that question and I have some work to do, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, now comes one of the questions that I see pop up a lot and at, at my beginning stages, I was kind of looking for this as well and I still Get, I even get asked this question um, and I know that a lot of people want to know this. So when building your course, what kind of platform or, you know, place should people build it on and host it on? You know, like I know there's so many um, platforms to use. I personally use Thinkific as my course, course platform, but like there's self-hosted and, you know, out, outsourced hosting like I'm doing. What? do you think is the best? And I know this isn't a loaded question because (laughs) there are so many options, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it. (laughs) Yeah. So you're right. There are a lot of options and I, I definitely don't have one right answer here. I think there are probably three main categories of places you can put your course. So one is self-hosted, which would be on your own site of some sort. Two is third party hosted. So that's like you would think a platform like Thinkific. Um, And then the third is a course marketplace. And that's something like a Udemy, a Skillshare, one of those big course platforms full of other people's programs. Um, Sometimes it comes down to your end goals, your experience, what you want the course to do for you. So third party platforms like you with Thinkific, that might be Teachable, Kajabi, MemberVault, there are hundreds of them. The upside of those is it's quick to get started. You don't need to have um, high tech skills most of the time. They're fairly plug and play, drag and drop. Um, They're already ready. You just upload your content, integrate your payment and off you go. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good big benefit. The downside to that is you have to build within their system. So it might not quite do everything you want it to do. It might not quite look the way you want it to look. Um, And if you've got a very specific end goal in mind, you're like, I want people to come in and to press this button and do this thing, then third party platforms just might not be flexible enough for what you want it to do. If you're self-hosting on your own site, it takes a little bit longer to get set up. You need a little bit more technical skill or you're going to need a bigger budget to get someone else to do it for you. Um, But the upside of that is you can build just about anything you want. Mm -hmm. It can do whatever you want it to do. Your dashboard can look like whatever you want it to look like. Like there are so many things you can do that if you're building a really sort of big engaged program and you want clients to have a specific experience, building on it on your own website gives them that experience. With um, the third part, with the course marketplaces like Udemy and Skillshare, they're a whole nother bull, bull game. If you've got a sort of low price entry level program that you want to reach the masses with, that's good for those sorts of things. But I'd never put your signature program or anything that's really sort of IP you're proud of over there mm-hmm. um, because the terms and conditions are just so wrought with things like they can show your content to other people and they can give their con- your content to any of team members they want to give it to and like Mm -hmm. there's so many things inside those terms and conditions that you just need to be really aware of before you put your content on there but it could be a a good sort of yeah I guess list builder audience yeah and that's how I see a lot of people approach it even if you've got a price on it because um Udemy has a habit for example of putting courses that were 100 or 200 dollars on sale for 9.99 yeah so in terms of income generating like it's really if some people do, some people generate a lot of income from those platforms, but most people don't. Um, it's like selling an ebook, right? It's, it's good yeah. for outreach. It's good for your brand, but you're really not going to get rich off it. Yeah. Um, it's the same with the courses on Udemy. Like you might be good for your brand. You might reach more people, but I wouldn't put all of your eggs into one basket and hope that you yeah. generate all your cash flow from there because it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, so many options to sort of think about. And I've gone through a number of platforms um, over the years, gone from self-hosted to um, a third party and from, I'm on third party now. So I definitely know that there is no, uh, no magical unicorn there. <laughs> no, no, there isn't. But I think you raise a good point there, which is also that you're not stuck. Like just because you do one in the beginning. And I think a lot of people are nervous about making a choice because they're worried about getting the wrong platform. Yeah. And the truth is that now most platforms are pretty good. Like they'll probably do just about everything that you need them to do and you'll yeah. be fine on there for a period of time and there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. And if something comes up and you really do need to move, you can move. Yeah. Like it's a bit of a drama and there's some work involved, but it's not the end of the world. It's not impossible. You download your content, you re-upload it somewhere else and off you go again. Yeah. So 
you're not stuck. That Yeah, that is definitely a good point. And actually a lot of the third party providers now help you move because obviously they want your business. So they are happy to help you migrate you know, yeah. content from one to another. So I haven't tried that, but I know it's, I know it's a possibility. So yeah, it's not a tattoo. It's not permanent. Yeah. So you can, you can move. Oh, so much gold in here. Thank you, Sam. Any other sort of, you know, gold nuggets or people, things that people need to know about turning their content into courses? The only thing I would probably say is baby steps. I mean, for you and for them, I always like, I advocate for putting your content in tiny baby steps for them, but the same logic applies to yourself, right? If you just write, create a course on your to-do list, it's never going to happen because every time you look at that, it's just going to be overwhelming. You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. It's too hard. So just try and think to yourself, all right, well, what, what is the first thing I need to do? Like, do I need to go and have a look at the platform? Do I need to work out my outcomes? Probably a good place to start. Yeah. Um, do I need to map out my content? Like where do I, need, what is the next step I need to do and try and aim for that next step? Um, I, yeah, I very ra- rarely write create course on my to-do list because it just will not happen. So no, yeah. just try and work out what is that single next step and start there and the rest will just come. You'll work it out. And I love that. It all comes back to writing now that writing down that outcome it's like what is the one thing or like you know the 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 suite of things like it doesn't have to be so many things what is the the one really one thing that you want someone to walk away with once they've done your course and I guess if you work from that and don't deviate from it because you know (laughs) that's usually my habit it's like but, (laughs) but I can teach them this and I can teach them that no stick to that one thing yes um it does become a lot easier um, to then work backwards and create your course. And I don't know what your take on this is because I've done this um, and, and it kind of goes against your bite-sized pieces a little bit. I've run um, workshops live, like as a, as a live online workshop and then turned that into a course, but it turns out to be a chunk of like a longer video. So maybe I need to chop it up into bite yeah, sized pieces. Yeah, I was going to say, but- yes, you can definitely chop those bigger videos up. So there's nothing wrong with taking what was a live program and, and making it sort of evergreen or taking your live webinar and making it evergreen. Um, people do still give them out as one hour webinars and you definitely can, but you might find there are natural breaks and you can break it into like step one, step two, step three, or yeah. this video, like in the first 20 minutes, you kind of spoke about this concept and then you kind of spoke about concept B. And so you can break the video down into bite-sized pieces. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it's what works for you and your audience. But yeah, sometimes there's a way. I found, I found it a really good way to test um, specific work, so workshop content, do it, to do it live first, like to yep. run it as a live class first, but maybe I'll go back and make it into bite-sized pieces now. So much to think about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting to the end. This is something I, I ask all of my um, uh, guests is, what are you curious about right now? Does it have to be work-related? No, no, not at all. <laughs> so my newsfeed at the moment is full of permaculture videos and all I'm watching oh. is like permaculture and primarily in India and I've no idea how that ended up in my newsfeed, but everything's mm-hmm. about, yeah, um, sustainable permaculture practices in India, which is really interesting if you ever want to go and sort of fall down a rabbit hole to things to learn about. That's mm-hmm. something you can learn about. There you go. So uh, that backyard of yours is uh, is going to transform, is it? <laughs> well, at the moment, it's just full of corn, really. So much corn. But oh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, there's lots growing out there. Exciting. And if you had an extra $1,000 in your marketing budget, what would you spend it on? I mean, I feel like if I'm talking to the Facebook ads expert, it should no, probably be Facebook ads. No, you don't have to ads. say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question, actually. I it probably, honestly, it probably would be advertising reach um, because it's something that I haven't done for a long time. And it's a gap in sort of my marketing that I just don't have anything going out right now. So it probably is the answer I would give. There you go. I seriously, every single episode I say this, I feel like I need to take it out because everyone seems to say advertising. And like, honestly, I promise you, I'm not telling people <laughs> to say this. <laughs> no, it's true. I think it's because most of us go like, if we um, if we're doing the things we know we should be doing, but if we had extra money, we'd put the extra money towards ads, right? Yeah. Because normally it's that it's, I just don't have the extra cash to put on top or I'm putting as yeah. much in as I can. But if I had extra, I'd put that in as well. So I actually yeah. think for most people I work with as well, they're at the stage in their business where if they had extra cash, that's probably where they'd put it. There you go. I just need to, you know, help everyone to make extra cash in. <laughs> 
All righty. That's the end of this week's show. If you have any questions about turning content into course and courses head to samwinch.com.au a really big thanks to you sam for being on the podcast it's so lovely talking to you (laughs) thank you for having me oh my pleasure and thanks to you for listening if you like the show don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star rating and review on itunes stitcher spotify or wherever you heard the podcast your review will help others find the show and learn more about the amazing world of online marketing And don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at newschoolofmarketing.com where you can learn more about Sam, check, check out useful links, download free resources and leave a comment about the show.